This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash uctv prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Now I would like to um, bring up Jade, and uh, Jade Hiramoto is going to talk about gender differences in PAD and how, uh, what kind of implications those have in treatment. Jade? Thank you, Peter. That was a great talk. So why don't we start off with a couple of questions. So if you all have your push button, what's the leading cause of death for women in the United States? Is it cancer? cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, or respiratory disease? What's the consensus? All right, cardiovascular disease. That is absolutely correct, but these are the four leading causes of uh, death for women in the United States. And the second question, do women have a lower prevalence of PAD compared to men? Press uh, one for yes, two for no, or three, the prevalences are the same. No, was the overwhelming response. Okay, well this, well, this will be interesting. So I think that everyone has sort of uh, embraced the cardiovascular disease bandwagon for women, but perhaps not so much for peripheral arterial disease. So I'm hoping to maybe, um, you know, increase your knowledge base on this topic through this talk. So as you all know, uh, peripheral arterial disease affects at least 8 million people in the, in the United States today. It's a major cause of functional impairment and limb loss. And an ABI less than one is an independent uh, predictor of an increased risk for myocardial infarction, stroke, and death. PAD uh, is very expensive. Uh, you may or may not know that uh, its costs are comparable or higher to coronary heart disease and stroke. And uh, despite these statistics, I don't think it's really you know, made aware in terms of the public clinicians and health payers uh, what these risks are associated with peripheral, art peripheral arterial disease. What about gender and PAD? Well, the prevalence of PAD is actually equal, if not slightly higher, in women compared to men. Women with PAD have higher rates of functional decline compared to men, and women actually suffer the same consequences uh, of PAD uh, at rates that are at least as high as those in men. And women may also suffer poor outcomes and higher complication rates after lower extremity revascularization for advanced PAD. Women are also less likely to be treated with optimal risk factor control in this uh, large registry, the REACH registry, with over 8,000 PAD patients. Uh, being a woman was an independent predictor of being uh, less likely to be managed with optimal risk factor control. And women are underrepresented in contemporary PAD revascularization studies. They comprise about a third of the studies in the last decade. And I think as a result of all of this, um, the AHA has recently released a call to action to raise the awareness of the burden of PAD in women and um, reach for clinical studies and trials to include women in PAD. So this is um, the data, these are the data, from three epidemiologic cohorts uh, sponsored by the NIH. And we had the opportunity to look at the levels of ABI stratified by gender. And if you look at all men and women with ABI less than one, actually women have a higher prevalence of a low ABI compared to men. And as you see from each of these cohorts, they're really overrepresented in that ABI of 0.9 to 1 category. Uh, these findings were also uh, confirmed in a very large cohort that you all probably are familiar with, the Lifeline Screening Cohort. We looked at over 119,000 men and women who voluntarily um, screen, were screened for uh, ABI as well as other um, risk factors, and you can see that women had a far higher prevalence of a low ABI, ABI less than 1 compared to men, and also a higher prevalence of an ABI less than 0.9. Um, in women compared to men. 
Well, you might say it's just an issue of misclassification. Women are different than men. We can't use the same cutoff for ABI as we do in it, you know, in, in both sexes because perhaps women have a lower normal uh, ABI compared to men. And it's probably true, and this was the only study that I could find looking at healthy participants in terms of trying to really delineate what a normal ABI is across gender and race. And there's a, you know, it's, it's a pretty marginal uh, difference. So in the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, women had an ABI that was 0 0.02 lower than men, and blacks had an ABI that was 0 0.02 lower than whites. However, if you then look at categories of ABI and what the associated cardiovascular risks are, you see that even in this, you know, sort of People might even consider this mild disease. Up until 2011, it was not considered abnormal to have an ABI between 0.9 and 1. The uh, hazard ratios for the risk of coronary heart disease death, incident PAD, and incident stroke are very high in women. They're at least as high in women as they are in men. So I don't think it's an issue of misclassification of risk. So why do women have higher age-adjusted rates of PAD? Um, if you look at those data and you look at car traditional cardiovascular risk factors, it doesn't appear to be explainable by traditional cardiovascular risk factors. So I think that there may be potential gender-specific risk factors that can explain this, but we just don't know what these are yet. And I think some of the contenders include inflammation, uh, chronic kidney disease, the prevalence of chronic kidney disease is actually higher in women compared to men in the United States. Men do go on at a faster rate to develop end-stage renal disease, but the prevalence of CKD is uh, higher in women than in men, and it's obviously a strong risk factor for PAD. Uh, social and economic factors may potentially uh, play a role. Women um, in those cohorts were more likely to be single, divorced, or widowed compared to men. Uh, and then there are a lot of postmenopausal changes in mineral metabolism that occur that may or may not be related. For example, low vitamin D levels have been associated with higher cardiovascular risk, um, as have higher phosphorus levels. And in the postmenopausal women, uh, phosphorus levels actually increase in those who are not taking estrogen replacement therapy. So I'm just going to share what we actually know about, um, a little bit about what we know about inflammation and PAD uh, in terms of the advanced uh, spectrum, uh, on the advanced end of the spectrum. So we know that chronic inflammation is a strong risk factor for PAD. We know that uh, C-reactive protein as well as fibrinogen are acute uh, phase reactants. And elevated markers of each or both have been shown to be associated with a high risk for myocardial infarction, stroke, and PAD. And several population studies have demonstrated higher levels of CRP and fibrinogen in women compared to men. And this is after adjusting for BMI, estrogen use, and age. And it's really of unclear clinical significance, but it's been fairly consistent in large population studies. And so it's unknown, and this is the question that we ask, whether differences in the inflammatory profiles in men and women could be important in the outcomes after lower extremity bypass grafting. So I just wanted to share the results of a research a study that we uh, took on and presented at the Western Vascular uh, Society meeting. We asked whether there are gender-based differences in the inflammatory phenotype of patients undergoing lower extremity bypass grafting, and whether this correlated with primary graft patency. Uh, we use the data from a prospective cohort from three academic medical centers in Boston where 225 patients were enrolled between uh, 2004 and 2008. And this specific study was undertaken to examine the relationship of different metabolic factors, inflammation, and outcomes following lower extremity bypass grafting with autogenous vein. It was not powered to look at gender differences, um, but it was strictly to look at these metabolic and inflammatory factors with outcomes. Uh, patients were excluded if they were treated with a prosthetic or non-autologous vein, um, if they had a hypercoagulable state or active infection or a significant illness within 30 days. And although patients with uh, small areas of dry gangrene or um, ulcers were included in the study, uh, patients with a deep space infection, large ulcers, or any that required debridement were excluded from participating.
So um, this study uh, evaluated multiple biomarkers. Blood was uh, collected at baseline in the fasting state on the day of the procedure. And then all samples were then analyzed in uh, at batches at a core laboratory. The CRP was determined using an immunoterritometric assay and the fibrinogen using an immunonephilometric technique. All patients were followed at one, three, six, nine, and 12 months, and after they hit the one-year time point, they were followed every six months. Um, they left graft reintervention up to the description of the operating surgeon. Uh, and loss of primary patency was defined by any graft revision, whether open or percutaneous, uh, or documentation of occlusion of the bypass graft without revision. Uh, these, these are statistical analyses. So we actually created cut points. Um, CRP was dichotomized at five milligrams per liter. This represented the upper limit of the core laboratory reference range, but it's also been shown to uh, be a, uh, represent a high risk subgroup, not only in a lower extremity bypass cohort, but also in a stroke cohort. In fibrinogen, uh, we dichotomized at a, at a higher level than one might expect at 600 because the overall values in our cohort were quite high. Uh, this represented the top quartile of values in the cohort. And these are the overall demographic characteristics of the cohort. I mean, we suffer the same issues. We had 28% uh, women uh, in this study. They were slightly older than the men. Um, the men were more likely to be current smokers, hyperlipidemic on statin therapy, but the women were more likely to present with critical ischemia. Uh, the women also had far higher CRP levels. That was statistically significant. And there is also a trend towards higher levels of fibrinogen in women, but this did not reach statistical significance. Um, in terms of the indications for treatment, uh, it was pretty evenly distributed uh, amongst claudicators, those with breast pain and those with ulcer or gangrene. 10% of patients had a redo bypass. Most patients, 80 per, nearly over 80%, underwent uh, reconstruction with a single segment of greater saphenous vein. And the outflow vessel was divided um, between uh, about 50% had a popliteal target and the other 50% had a tibial or pedal target. And these anatomic differences were not different um, between the men and the women in this study. So there were 78 primary graft failures over a median follow-up of almost 900 days. And if you look at the overall primary patency rates by gender, you see that um, women had a higher rate, rate of graft loss in the uh, cohort, um, but this did not reach statistical significance. We then um, looked at the bivariate associations between all of these uh, predictors and stratified it by gender to try to see what might be important um, based on gender. And we also looked at the bivariate associations in the entire cohort so that we could create a multivariable model. Uh, again, we had a small cohort, limited numbers of failures, uh, and so we wanted to be fairly parsimonious with our model. We chose to include race, diabetes, and critical ischemia in our model. Uh, we also used a composite vein as one of the predictors because it's been known to be associated with uh, primary graft uh, loss. But if you just look at the stratified um, results here, you can see that uh, elevated CRP and elevated fibrinogen were predictors of graft loss in women, but not in men. Uh, these are the results of the multivariable model. Again, results stratified by gender. And we didn't include CRP and fibrinogen in the same model because, uh, number one, we had a limited number of outcomes, and number two, CRP and fibrinogen were actually highly correlated in our model. But you can see that in both men and women in this multivariable model, uh, black race was uh, an independent predictor of graft loss. We didn't have, uh, we only had 17 blacks in our cohort. So we were a little limited in that, but I, I think that this is a pretty strong uh, predictor. And you can see that in women, but not in men, a CRP level greater than five uh, was associated with an increased uh, statistically significant risk of graft loss, uh, but not in men. And there was a very strong um, uh, interaction between gender and CRP. Again, looking at the overall cohort, um, if you look at those who had elevated CRP, they did uh, tend to 
have a higher risk of a graph loss compared to those with CRP less than five. Again, it did not reach statistical significance. But then when you break this down by gender, you see that this is really driven by the results in the women. So those women with elevated CRP levels uh, were highly likely to lose their graft compared to those women with low CRP levels, and this effect was not seen in the men in the cohort. What about fibrinogen? Pretty similar findings. Black race was a uh, independent predictor of uh, loss of, of graft patency. In men um, who presented with critical ischemia, they were more likely to lose their grafts. Uh, and again, the same interaction was seen between gender and fibrinogen uh, in this group. Those women with fibrinogen levels greater than 600 were much more likely uh, to lose their graft patency over the study course uh, compared to women. Uh, with fibrinogen less than 600. So pretty similar findings. Again, those with uh, fibrinogen greater than 600, uh, a trend towards a higher risk of graft um, loss. But again, this was largely driven by the women with high fibrinogen levels, whereas in the men, actually, you see a qualitative interaction. Um, this was not statistically significant. So. What do we know? I mean, I think we have limited data. Uh, the study that we uh, that I just described here uh, is certainly not definitive. It was a, a small cohort with limited numbers of women and limited numbers of uh, blacks. But I think it's highly provocative, and I think it's potentially hypothesis generating. But what we found was that women undergoing lower extremity bypass grafts for advanced PAD seem to have a different inflammatory phenotype compared to men. So that was seen in our population of advanced PAD patients, uh, and also it's seen in these large population studies of healthy individuals. Um, elevated baseline levels of CRP and fibrinogen uh, were associated with inferior primary uh, patency in women, but not in men. Um, again, I think that this deserves further study, but it potentially could affect treatment. Um, perhaps women in those high CRP or high fibrinogen quartiles should receive more aggressive graft surveillance. Maybe they need a different antiplatelet regimen. Maybe they need their risk factors modified to a different level. Um, unclear at this point. But it does suggest that there is some interplay between gender and inflammation, potentially in the healing response after lower extremity bypass grafting. What about the overall conclusions with women in PAD? Um, I think that at the beginning of the talk, um, most people thought that women had a, um, a lower prevalence of PAD compared to men, but I hope now by the end of the talk you can appreciate that they have the same, if not greater prevalence of PAD um, compared to men. Uh, this does not appear to be explained by traditional cardiovascular risk factors. It's still unclear to me why if women have a higher prevalence of PAD, at least based on, you know, ABI, why we don't operate on more women. Maybe they don't progress to critical ischemia uh, as quickly uh, as men, or maybe it's just a different disease in women. Um, and it's not sh uh, clear at this point of differences in inflammatory profiles or any of these gender-based risk factors um, can explain this greater prevalence in women. Uh, and women suffer from the same risk of adverse uh, cardiovascular complications as men. So women with a low ABI have the same risk in terms of uh, development um, of cardiovascular, adverse cardiovascular events, MI, stroke. They have the, the same, uh, if not slightly higher, risk of the disease. And so I think that the woman who comes to your office who um, has PAD, has a low ABI, they should be uh, aggressively managed in terms of reverse factor modification uh, as, as men. Thanks.